realm niya. But he was worried about Lanao because he knew that uh, the Spaniards would be coming to Lanao because that was part of the treaty. So after consolidating his uh, realm here in Cotabato and uh, Saboyan, finally the people of Boyan, the chiefs of Boyan accepted him as uh, uh, the sovereign. He went to Lanao seven years after the uh, signing of the uh, Lopez Cudara Treaty. This was in 1652. It was a wise move on his part because he was hitting many birds with one stone. First, in treaty with the Spaniards, gave him the opportunity, the space and time for him to consolidate his realm dito sa Maguindanao. Secondly, the chiefs of uh, Lanao, Northern Lanao, ayaw magpailalim sa kanya. So, ginawa niya ito para the same manner that what he did to the people of Bayan, to the chiefs of Bayan, mapailalim sila sa kanyang uh, sultanate so that he could effectively fight the Spaniard in a united uh, realm. That was September of 1652. No? When the chiefs learned that he was coming, binigyan siya ng malaking piesta. He told them, sabi niya, the Spaniards are coming. You have to fight the Spaniards. And that was when the chiefs, they protested. They rejected his offer na hindi namin kakalabanin ng mga Espanyol kasi wala naman sila rito. That was when he made that speech of his, that famous speech. In his famous speech, exhorting the Maranao Datus and Sultans of Lake Lanao to carry on the fight, Claire Jihad against the Spanish invaders. Oh, kayong mga tagalawa, na sadya lang nakakalimot sa inyong sinaunang kalayaan ay tuluyan lang nagpasakop sa mga Kastila. Ang inyong pagsuko ay ng tarang kahangalan. Hindi ninyo lubos na nauunawaan ang kalakit ng inyong pagsuko. Ipinagbibili ninyo ang inyong sarili para magpaalitin para sa binipisyo lamang ng mga dayuhang ito. Kung kayo ay mas mahina ang loob kaysa sa kanila, asahan ninyo ang katulad na pagtrato. Kayo, tulad nila, sa ayaw niyo sa gusto ay magiging tagasaguan. Tulad ng kanilang ginagawa, kayo ay magbubuno ng braso sa kanilang pagawaan ng mga barko at magtatrabaho ng walang humpay sa hindi inyong pampublikong gawain. Matitik na ninyo ang pinakamasiging pagtrato habang naninulbi ang alipin. Magpakatatag kayo. Hayaan ninyong tulungan ko kayong lumaban. Aking ipinapangako, buong pwersa ng aking sultanato ay ipagtatanggol kayo. Sultan, paano naman ang aming mga ani? Tama. Tama. Eh, ano naman kung manayag ang mga Kastila sa umpisa? Hindi ba yan ay katumbas lamang ng isang taong ani? Mas matimbang ba ang alagang yan? para ipagpalit sa panghabang buhay na kalayaan. The Maranaos went down to Iligan where the Spaniards were already preparing for the invasion. Uh, they attacked the Spaniards. Doon. So that was the beginning of the resistance of the people of Ranao because of that speech made by Sultan Kudarat. Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! Sultan Kudarat's period was the golden age of Islamic Jihad against the foreign aggression, and he became the symbol of the unconquered Bangsamoro status quo until the present period. Sultan Kudarat died at the old age of 90 in 1671. Through that speech that you referred to, exalt the Maranao to resist Spain, to uh, a point that that is why the Spaniards uh, made that policy of isolation, because the, the Maranaos resisted after Kudarat uh, made that speech. In 1751, Spain passed a royal decree known as the Privateer System which marked the beginning of the bloodiest period in the history of the Moro-Spanish War. 
The decree provided for the encouragement and enlistment of private individuals to organize expeditions against the Moros, similar to the present Ilaga, Kafgu, CVO, and other paramilitary groups. The incentives were tempting and rewarding. It stipulated the total extermination of the Moros, burning of everything combustible that they owned, and the desolation of all crops and farmlands. Criminals who enlisted were granted unconditional pardon, and all enlistees were exempted from paying tribute and were entitled to four-fifths of the booty. Thousands enlisted for the mercenary expeditions. As anticipated, the results were quick and bloody. On February 27, 1851, Spain launched a massive assault in Holo, employing a fleet of three steamboats, two gunboats, nine transports, 21 barangays, and other boats of different sizes. The attacking forces were composed of 142 officers, 2,876 men, and about a 1,000 native volunteers. On the defender's side were about 10,000 Moro warriors. Holo was bombarded first, and then ground assaults followed. In the ensuing fighting, the Spaniards reported 34 dead and the Moros 300. Holo was razed to the ground. This infamous event later occurred again in February the 7th, 1974 when the Philippine government forces burned Holo to the ground while fighting the Moro National Liberation Front. It has caused estimated innocent Muslim lives of 20,000 due to air, land, and sea bombardment. In a bid to break all forms of resistance and to settle once and for all the issue of sovereignty over the Moros, Spain launched on February the 21st, 1876, what became known as the Final Holo Campaign. Governor General José Melcampo personally led the campaign, involving 9,000 troops, 10 steamboats, 11 gunboats, and 11 transports. Public approval, especially on the issue of religious enmity, was carefully sought to support the campaign. In the forefront of this campaign were the friars of the various denominations, Recollects, Jesuits, Dominicans, and Augustinians. Together they heralded, the war in Holo is now a just war, a holy war in the name of religion, or War without quarters or rest for the wicked sons of the Qur'an. War to the death with blood and fire. One quota after another fell in intense and bloody fighting and was put to the torch. In the face of these assaults, the Sultan, warriors and retainers retired to the interior to fight another day. The campaign of Governor General José Melcampo weakened the capability of the Sulu Sultanate to retaliate against Spain. This eventually paid the way for the signing of a treaty with the Spanish crown in July 22, 1878, making the whole of Sulu a protectorate of Spain. We call this sometimes uh, Spanish Sultanate of Sulu Treaty of Peace of 1878. And uh, meron tayong mga around four, four basic features of these treaties. Number one, uh, through the treaty itself, I'm talking of the Treaty of Peace of 1878, Spain was allowed by the Sultanate of Sulu to build garrison, a small garrison, covering about 15 acres in Holo Town itself. In Holo. So they were able to build within, but only building, and they had people there in the area, but they, cannot, they were not able to go out. Of the out of the fort, out of the camp, out of the garrison itself. Okay, so basically the entire holo was still under the effective control of the Sultanate of Sulu. That's the first provision. The second feature of the of the Treaty of Peace of 1878 was uh, holo will now be 
a protectorate state. Protectorate. So, protectorate state of Spain, which means to say that uh, the protection, the aid, and support of the Sultan of Sulu is now in the hands or are now in the hands of the Spanish authorities. And the third one, there was payment to the Sultanate of, to the Sultan of Sulu and his uh, datus, uh, ranging from 250 to 11,500 Mexican pesos pay annually. In 1861, Spain built a garrison in Cotobato and later became the capital of Mindanao. But after a fire and earthquake hit Cotabato the following year, the capital was returned to Zamboanga. In 1888, Governor General Emilio Terrero was replaced by Governor General Valeriano Weyler. Instead of pursuing the military campaign against Dato Uto of Baguindanao, the new governor trained his attention on the Iranuns and Maranaos. In April 1891, Spanish troops reoccupied Parang, Baras, and Malabang in Lanao. Thrown into action in this attack against the Maranaos were 1,242 officers and men. Fierce encounters followed, especially in the Kota commanded by Datu Amai Pakpak. In September of the same year, the campaign was terminated without conquering the Lake Moros. In March 1894, even after Governor General Whaler had left for Manila, the 112 Spaniards pursued the campaign without let-up. Pantan, near Marawi, was occupied. The Datus of Taraka, Ramayin, Masiu, and Lumbatan felt threatened, and consequently they cooperated to fortify their positions around the Agus River. In the book entitled Bangsamoro, A Nation Under Endless Tyranny, Salah Jubair mentioned that this was the state of affairs during the last years of the Spanish presence in Mindanao and Sulu. Her entire firepower resources and manpower were all utilized to subjugate Mindanao and Sulu. And the Moros were still on their feet, not on their knees as a fitting tribute to their gallantry and determination to resist even against formidable odds, history has appropriately referred to the Moros as the unconquered. Ako po'y naniniwala na talagang hindi ho nakunkira mga Moros na mga Espanyol. And that is more on the physical side to it. If we examine, kung titignan natin ang history, Ang effective lang na nakontrol ng, ng mga Espanyol yung ilalim ng fortification nila at saka yung mga settlement nila. Aside from that, yung lahat na nasa labas eh, kontrolado na ng mga Moro. Either in Sulu, in Cotabato, Bali, ano ba din Lanao. So, yun hindi pagkakungkir ng mga Moro, it's more physical. And physically, I think, uh, that's the most uh, effective and most uh, clear evidence that outside of the fort and fortification of the Spaniards, the Moros were ruling the day. And aside from that, Islam as a religion of the Moros was still intact up to the last uh, Spaniards left uh, the islands of Mindanao and Sulu. And even the custom and tradition of the Moros were safely intact. So, physically, culturally, in terms of religion, in terms of fighting spirit of the Moros, the Moros were really unconquered by the Spaniards. Spain came to this peaceful Islamic land not much for the cross. In most instances, as the facts of her actuations were gradually exposed, religion was merely used to justify what otherwise was a greedy lust for worldly gain and glory.
Spain had firmly planted the cross in the Philippines and was no less successful in sowing the seeds of hatred and animosities between the Moros and the Indios. Well, the other legacy, although in the reverse uh, psychology, is aside from planting the seed of hatred and animosity, biases, prejudices between the Moros and the Christians or the Indios, eh, the bonds of uh, capable, brave Span Spanish generals were still buried in the souls of Mindanao eh, and, and, and Sulu. So these are the other legacies aside from the hatred and emotion planted uh, by the Spaniards between the Moros and the Christianized natives. And uh, thirdly, uh, Fort Pilar. Fort Pilar is there in Jambuanga City until today it is still stands. So that's another legacy of the Spaniards when they were here in Mindanao. And uh, that goes to show that despite the presence of the Spaniards in Mindanao, Islam is still the predominant religion among the Muslims. And uh, the Muslims, as I said earlier, were never conquered by the Spaniards. Even if the 39 Christianized natives absorbed the greater part of the misfortune that befell the entire inhabitants of Luzon and the Visayas, this was a consequence of collaboration, even if they did this against their wishes. Among the Moro, Moros, there were 13 ethno-linguistic tribes, 13. I would not uh, mention the, uh, the, the tribes, we know that very clearly. But of the Christian natives, there are 39 uh, ethno-linguistic tribes, the Tagalogs, the Kapampangan, the Ilocanos, the Ilongos, the, the Cebuanos, uh, so on and so forth. As to whether there are uh, collaborators among the Muslims, well, it's more of, uh, not in the strict sense of the word, generally, there, there were no collaborators among the Muslims. The long list of Spanish invasions in Mindanao and Sulu showed the participations of thousands of these natives and their racial brothers, the Moros, found it almost impossible to discriminate the proselytized subjects from the colonial masters. Both were one in creating havoc in Mindanao and Sulu. <laughs> On February the 25th, 1898, America declared war on Spain after the sinking of the USS Maine in Havana, Cuba. Admiral George Dewey was ordered to proceed to Manila to attack the Spanish Armada under Admiral Patricio Montojo. On May 1st, 1898, the Battle of Manila Bay began with the Filipino revolutionaries allied with the Americans defeated the Spanish forces until on June 12, 1898, after the last Spanish soldier had surrendered. General Emilio Aguinaldo miscalculated his declaration of Philippine independence in Kawit Cavite without knowing the real motives of the Americans. If Aguinaldo did not really misread the American intention, but deliberately played a calculated game, then he had blundered. The Americans never had the slightest intention of recognizing his declaration of independence. As a matter of fact, American troops began to occupy strategic areas vacated or surrendered to them by the retreating Spaniards, to the exclusion of the Filipino revolutionaries. As soon as they had gained enough strategic grounds, the Americans intentionally provoked the Filipinos into a shooting war which set off the start of the Filipino-American War. At the onset, the Filipinos were made to believe that the Americans came to help 
to liberate their lands from the Spaniards, after which they would become an independent nation. Untrue to their words, the Americans did not really come to liberate the Philippines for the Filipinos, but to acquire a colony in the furtherance of their own imperialist scheme. The Treaty of Paris of 1898 was an agreement that resulted in the Spanish Empire surrendering control of Cuba and ceding Puerto Rico, parts of the Spanish West Indies, the island of Guam and the Philippines to the United States. The treaty was signed on December 10th, 1898 and ended the Spanish-American War. The Treaty of Paris came into effect on April the 11th, 1899, when the documents of ratification were exchanged. The Treaty of Paris was signed, uh, ceding not only uh, Guam, Puerto Rico, and uh, Cuba, but including the Philippines for a sum of 20 million U.S. dollars. Knowing that there is a very strong sultanate in that area, but upon the coming of the Americans with the Treaty of Paris, the Americans slowly started to come down to the southern islands and tried to enter into the Sulu archipelago. On the eve of the signing of the Kiram Bates Agreement, there were three hard postulates that were molesting the minds of the Americans. There were still 34,000 armed Moros in the Moro country and the various islands were in such a dangerous condition that no place could be safe for outsiders. The American occupation forces had a hard time containing the onslaught of the Filipino revolutionaries led by General Emilio Aguinaldo when the Filipino-American War flared up in Luzon and some parts of the Visayas. The Americans feared any strategic or tactical tie-up between the northern insurgents and the southern warriors. Such an eventuality would have been too hot to handle, even for the best of the American generals. Even President William McKinley had entertained serious skepticism over the sovereignty of Spain over the Moro country, particularly the Sulu Sultanate. So after the signing of the Treaty of Paris in 1898, American policy in the Philippines was actually uh, focused on containing the resistance in Luzon. It was the problem that the resistance in the southern part of the country, in, in, in Mindanao, especially among Muslims, the Sultanate of Sulu, the Sultanate of Maguindano, and the royal houses in Lanao, were also generating so much uh, esteem that the American authorities uh, in, in the country uh, made problem out of it. So in 1899, as a ploy, as a ploy America started to negotiate treaties uh, with, the, with, the, with the Sultanate of Sulu. Uh, the, the exchange between the Sultanate of Sulu in their proposals during the negotiation uh, were finally reduced into a single document called the, the Bates Treaty of 1899. When the Americans came first, they tried to extract a treaty from the Sultan of Sulu. And this, the, this is the infamous ba Kiram Bates Treaty. And uh, it extracted light an agreement uh, with the Sultan, but the Bates Treaty, the Kiram Bates Treaty, had two versions. One is what the Sultan thought, thought to be his ver he, the, the original version, which was written in Arabic text in the Taosug language, and this was translated into English with the English text also. So that the, Kira, the Kiram Bates Treaty was not actually ratified in U.S. Congress, and maybe because one of the uh, uh, of the reasons was because the two versions did not was 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 not actually did not coincide with each other. There was some variation in the translation. So the American government also thought that maybe they thought that it's not it's you it's. It's not useful because the translation does not, does not jive 
with the one that was written in the Arabic text and Tausug language. But all the while, the Sultan of Sulu thought that the, the Kiram Bay Treaty was standing. Beyond any tint of doubt, the United States did not come to the Philippines in 1898 for the islands of Luzon and Visayas alone, but to claim more territories. Fired by imperialist agenda, her intention to include the Moro country was never doubtful. However, the war with the Northerners was still raging and any mishandling of the Moros could be disastrous. Even a sort of treaty was in order. And therefore, as earlier said, the signing of the Kiram Bates Treaty, more than any other reasons, was a dilatory tactic to neutralize the Moros while the pacification campaign in the northern areas was still underway. Consequently, the shift from non-interference to direct rule shaped up with the creation of the Moro province. The main reason given for the change of approach from non-interference to direct intervention with the creation of the Moro province was to prepare the Moros for integration into the body politics of the colonial government. The base treaty of 1899 provided, among others, for the following number one, mutual respect between the U.S and the Sultanate of Sulu over the Moro autonomy. <laughs> Moro autonomy. And second, that the United States of America will not or shall not uh, give or sell out any portion of the Sultanate of Sulu to any nation. And that, uh, as uh, required or demanded by the Sultan of Sulu, the continuing compensation, which was also uh, one of the concessions they got from Spain when they signed the 1878 uh, Treaty of Peace will have to be continued. So these were the main features of the, of the Bates Treaty. In May 1899, American troops landed in Holo. On October 30, the military district of Mindanao, Holo and Palawan was constituted. On November 16, Sambuanga was occupied. On December 1899 to January 1900, the southern coasts of Mindanao, including Cotabato, Davao, Mati, Parang, Polyok, Bananga, were garrisoned. As more troops poured in, an offshoot of the end of the Filipino-American War in 1901, friction started to occur between the Moros and the Americans. As far as America was concerned, the Bates Treaty was not actually a treaty itself. Because later on in 1904, it abrogated the treaty, saying that it was a mere executive agreement or a modus vivendi, uh, only to buy time because there was resistance in Luzon. And now that in 1904, resistance has already been overcome in Luzon, and they have already established their own uh, government in Luzon, it was already time for them to disown the treaty, the Bates Treaty, with the Sultanate of Sulu, with the Sultan of Sulu. Mm -hmm. On March 2, 1904, they did exactly what they were expected to do. President Theodore Roosevelt, without the slightest conjunction or any moral or ethic consideration, unilaterally declared the treaty null and for it. In essence, the U.S. policy in relation with the Moros was in line with the treatment of the American Indians whereby agreements made with them were set aside as convenience dictated. These agreements carried no weight and no binding effects on the Americans on the malicious pretext that the Moros, like the Red Indians, were savages. The Kiram Bates Treaty had practically ceased to exist already when the Moro province was created on June 1, 1903. The Moro province was under the direct supervision of the civil governor of the Philippine Islands and the Philippine Commission, similar to the present autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao of today.
the creation of the Moro province was deemed the transitional machinery for the shift from the military to civil rule in the Moro territory. The first governor of the Moro province was Major General Leonard Wood. As governor of the province, he adopted the mailed fist policy, or simply the use of brute force, to quell even a minor military problem. His background, either as military man or political leader, was far from desirable. As officer of the Rough Riders Regiment, he first saw action against the Indians and then against the Spaniards in Cuba in 1898. In his characteristic arrogant ways, he bluntly told the Sulu Sultan on the eve of the abrogation of the treaty. I want to be very frank with you here. At present, your rights as a nation, nothing. We will be here forever, I believe, unless a greater country comes and drives us away. We don't know of such country. November 1909, Brigadier General John C. Pershing took over as governor of the Moro province and lasted up to December 15, 1913, when the Department of Mindanao and Sulu was created. Like General Wood, he was a veteran of the Indian Wars and the Spanish-American War, and later in Mexico against Pancho Villa. A year after his stint in Mindanao, he was appointed commander of the World War I American Expeditionary Force in Europe. During his term as head of the Moro province, he was responsible for the creation of the first Christian colony of settlers in Mindanao in 1912. Although he continued the educational programs of his predecessors, it was under him that the number of Moro children increased. However, disarmament of the Moros was his major achievement. Under him, the province greatly progressed particularly in ways of the American system of governance, which eventually led to the appointment of the first civilian rule in Mindanao and Sulu. In 1916, the legislative power over the Moro country was transferred to the Philippine legislature as per stipulated in the Jones Law. In 1920, the control of the Moro affairs, except for a few positions held by Americans, was in the hands of non-Muslim Filipinos. On February 5, 1920, the Department of Mindanao and Sulu was formally abolished by an Act Number 2878 of the Philippine Legislature. Instead, the Bureau of Non-Christian Tribes was organized. Teofisto Gingona Sr., a native Christian, succeeded as head of the office. In 1936, a further change was effected with the renaming of this office into the Commission on Mindanao and Sulu with Dansalan, now Marawi City, as its headquarters. As early as May 1899, despite the Kiram Bates Treaty, trouble already erupted in Mindanao and Sulu. The main reason was that the next level chiefs, after seeing that the sultans were giving in too much to the dictates of the Americans, started to assert themselves. Very soon, serious military confrontations flared up in various parts of the Moro country. The Sultan of Sulu fared, as allies in the cable, fared to uh, deliver uh, his obligations under the treaty. Uh, referring, of course, to the continuing resistance coming from the people. Coming from the people. Uh, because the people uh, didn't really want to have to be under the uh, jurisdiction or sovereignty of the United States of America. These events led one American writer, Joseph Ralston Hayden, to comment that never during the entire continental expansion of the United States had armed encounters been frequent and serious as that between the Moros and the American troops. The Moros' bold display of heroism, bravery, 
and determination, even against formidable odds, spoke of their undying spirits to fight for their religion, people, and lands. The living legacy to this was the invention of the 1911 45 caliber pistol, which was specially designed by John Browning to stop the highly morale Moro fighters. As early as April 1902, a large-scale engagement occurred in Bayang Lanao del Sur. About 1,200 American troops were thrown into action against the 600 warriors of the Sultan of Bayang and of nearby settlements. <laughs> سألقي في قلوب الذين كفروا الرعب فاضربوا فوق الأعناق واضربوا منهم كل بنان. In 1903, led by Panglima Hassan in alliance with many minor Datus, confronted the Americans. With about 400 followers, including women and children, he assaulted the American troops stationed in Holo. The struggle of Panglima Hassan was short-lived. On March 4th, 1904, he was martyred at his hideout during the Battle of Bud Bagsak. But the Americans found in him a ferocious fighter who never hesitated to throw himself in battle, even to drive out the Americans. The first battle of Bud Daho, also known as the Battle of Mount Daho, was a counterinsurgency action fought by American soldiers against Moros in March 1906. While fighting was limited to the ground action on Holo Island in the Sulu archipelago, use of naval gunfire contributed significantly to the overwhelming firepower brought to bear against the insurgents who were mostly armed with melee weapons. The description of the engagement as a battle is disputed because of the overwhelming firepower of the attackers and the lopsided casualties. The conflict, especially the final phase of the battle, is also known as the Moro Crater Massacre. Very inhuman uh, treatment of, against the natives. But from the perspective of our people, from the perspective of our grandfathers and aunties and great-grandfathers, that incident was a, a, with, with willingness from our people. It was parang sabil. You do not engage in parang sabil if you are, if you are not uh, pure, if you are not really convinced that you are going to do it. Because, you know, Fear will come in when you hear the cannons, you hear the firearms of the Americans. There will be fear and you should not run away from it. That is the concept of Parang Sabil to the Tausus. So that after that, the Sultan in Maimbung was already alarmed because uh, more than 700 people were killed in that mountain. I am a direct descendant. My great-grandfather... Jalalain and his wife was one of those who climbed Buddhalipau, the mountain of Buddhalipau, and called uh, the other relatives and some more people from the islands, including from the island of Pata, to join them in the last uh, Parang Sabil against the American people. So they, they, it is very sentimental when it's narrated to us because they, for a whole week, they climbed the mountain, they stayed there. They were reading the Quran and they were also playing the Kulintangan and the Agong. We have a cave in the mountain, Talipaw. So uh, the Americans started to attack them. And uh, there, were who, there were those who survived. Uh, my, my auntie told me that one of, the, of, an, of a, young, a young female baby was actually thrown out. Of the, of the fence. They created a fence so that they cannot run out. And they tied down their feet to the ground so that they cannot run. They intentionally wanted to die in that mountain rather than being Christianized. That's, that's how they think. Being Christianized by this new 
rulers who are coming in to the Sulu archipelago. The extent of the ferocity of combat and the distraught condition of the American occupation forces could be reflected in one of the most favorite expressions. The only good Moro is a dead Moro. No less than 20,000 Moros were killed in actions from 1899 to 1916. From 1904 to the end of General Wood's term as governor of the Moro province in 1906, the Moros suffered 3,000 dead against 70 Americans. The Americans continued to govern the Moros with an iron fist, suppressing any resistance with a superior force. While American bureaucrats occupied key government institutions, gradually they were replaced by Christian Filipinos with a so-called Filipinization of the country, which the Moros interpreted as Christianization. The Moros, on the other hand, were excluded from the decision-making processes of the government. When the idea of a Philippine Republic began to surface, Moro leaders petitioned the American colonial government protesting their inclusion to the new republic. This culminated in the petition to the President of the United States of America from the people of the Sulu Archipelago in 1921 the Sambuanga Declaration of 1924, the Dansalan Declaration of 1935, and many others. Actually, it's the same, because uh, although earlier than the uh, Sambuanga Declaration, there was still a petition of the uh, Datus of Zulu earlier. And what is common in all these uh, political documents is the desire of the Bansamoro to be free. And the Sambuanga Declaration is more, uh, more pragmatic in the sense that, okay, if you can't do it, if you can't do it in the Philippines, then after 50 years, you should give us a chance to decide for ourselves. Na, to become part, still retain, to be part of the Philippines, or to be independent, or even to be part of the United States. In the Sambuanga Declaration, the Moro Datus, led by Sultan Mangingin of Maguindanao, demanded that, in the event that the United States grants independence to the Philippine Islands without provision for our retention under the American flag, it is our firm intention and resolve to declare ourselves an independent constitutional sultanate to be known to the world as Moro Nation. It must be emphasized that in this particular document the term Moro Nation was used by the signatories which if you translate into Bahasa Malayo becomes Bangsamoro. Mm. The uh, Petition of 1934. Uh, this was the, you know, the, the expression ng uh, sentimento ng mga Muslim religious scholars dun sa yung sa fear nila na uh, eventually kung may gagawin na constitution or kung ibibigay magkakaroon ng independence at masasali sila dapat guaranteed sa constitution na preserve, protected ang Islam. Walang change sa Islam. In fact, 14 times na na-mention dun sa petition ng ang Islam. Okay? Ang Islam. Sino mga signatories nito? Sino nag-sign nito? More than 230 Muslim scholars, religious people in Lanao. Mga imams, mga ulama, mga mga sheikhs, mga sheikh, mga sultans, datus, 